animals and humans get very smart very quickly mm -hmm. with a lot less data than we feed large language models or large multimodal models at the moment. Mm -hmm. So here he's, he said that current LLMs, the amount of text data they are trained on, mm -hmm. would take 20,000 years for a human to read. Mm. That's astounding. Like, you know, and, and we can see this. Like, when, we, when I go to med school, you know, I read textbooks, I read papers. I don't read anywhere near as much as ChatGPT does. Mm -hmm. Yet we've seen in evaluations in medicine that, yeah. you know, we still do a lot better in exams as human doctors. The models we have today are very one dimensional. They are trained only on one thing. They are trained to do only one thing mm -hmm. and they have only one reward. Everything is just like, it seems extreme. We are, as we mentioned, we are completely brute forcing it. <laughs> yeah. We just found one thing that works well and we decided we will scale, scale this a trillion times. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Dev and Doc, a podcast where developers and doctors join forces to deep dive into AI in healthcare. My name's Josh, I'm a neurologist in London and AI researcher. And with me today is... Jelko and I'm a developer. Great. So we have a really exciting topic today about artificial general intelligence, but why don't you give us the, the introduction, yeah. Joko? So I think everyone today is discussing artificial general intelligence. There's, there's been quite a bit of noise and a bit of drama that was happening in OpenAI. Some people are speculating, oh, that's because of AGI. Like, if you don't know what was happening, like Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI yes. was fired by the board. Everyone was thinking, oh, the reasons could be AGI was achieved internally, he was trying to trick everyone, and then uh, then once he told the board, the board fired him. There are many other yeah. speculations, but we don't want to go too much into that. But in any case, like it's obviously a big topic. Yeah. And also there was these mentions of the algorithm called like Q-star. Oh yeah, the secret algorithm, yes. which has achieved AGI potentially. Yeah, again, no one knows about this. No one knows what it is. Someone somewhere heard, mm. basically somewhere a mention of Q-star at OpenAI, and they're like, okay, Q-star is maybe something with deep Q learning, which is an algorithm, which is a way of learning in uh, deep reinforcement learning. Mm. And they connected that with a couple of other things in reinforcement mm. learning, and they were like, okay, that is now Q-star. <laughs> So all of this was all of this happened just basically from one word someone mentioning Q star. Which is Wait, that's really funny because the whole purpose of OpenAI is to create artificial general intelligence. Yeah. So the idea that Sam Altman would be fired because of achieving their primary goal is quite funny, I think. Yeah, I think that is it is very strange. I think it was I don't know. You we can just speculate here and say like, mm. oh maybe it was because he it was too soon. He wanted to mm. make it public, he whatever was happening or there. Commercial, commercialize or commercialize it. Because yeah. there are talks that, you know, Sam Altman is very entrepreneurial and kind of yeah. commercial driven. So whether that's yeah, he wants the AGI to do commercial things yeah. rather than beneficial things to society, you know, that's another discussion. Yeah, but I think the thing we can take away from this is obviously AGI is the topic today. Yeah. And the thing is, how do we achieve AGI? I think there are two mm. main camps. Yes. So there's, um, for those who don't know, there's two heavyweights. There's Jan LeCun, one of the godfathers of AI, and Jeffrey Hinton, also another godfather of AI. Um, and currently there's a big discussion about how do we achieve artificial general intelligence? Do we model it after the human brain? Um, and do we, is the current architecture enough to reach AGI? So Jan LeCun very much thinks that currently large language mm -hmm. models and other AI models we have are simply not good enough. Like we're just brute forcing it at this point. We're just feeding it more and more data. We're giving transformers more and more data. And we hope that it can do things that humans can do. We've mm. seen the shortcomings of large language models, despite more and more data and more and more computes. Um, whereas on the other side, Jeffrey Hinton thinks that the transform ar architecture is enough. We just need more data, better quality data, mm. and essentially uh, we can scale that way. Yeah, I think there are two more things in this. Um, 
because on one side Jeffrey Hinton is basically mm. saying that we are very close to AGI, we mm -hmm. will not be able to control it. Mm. This also goes a bit above AGI, I think this goes into super AGI, yes. so something that is that shot past human capabilities mm -hmm. and can do everything better than a human. Yeah. And Jeffrey Hinton is basically saying that we will achieve this very soon, we will not be able to control this AI and it will be the end of the world. Mm. On the other side, Jan Lekun, we are just mentioning these two, but in every one of these different streams you have many, many prominent researchers, mm -hmm. scientists that are basically for one of these options. Yeah, so like Elon Musk and Sam Altman, uh, they have been you know, in front of Congress testifying yeah. about their fears of AGI and you know, they're even proposing, you know, to saying that it could really endanger the world, they mm. should put limits on it. This is very like a sci-fi esque, like Terminator yeah. scenario, um, where they think once AGI is achieved, they it will kind of skyrocket into yeah. artificial super intelligence that can take over humanity. Yeah, and I think the results that Sam Altman and Elon Musk and similar uh, have achieved is basically that we are now getting a bit of regulation mm. in um, AI. I think this is the stupidest outcome we could have possibly imagined. Yeah. It, the way it is, the last regulation that came out was basically based on the size of the model. Yeah, oh, I saw the, the White House um, guidelines. Yes. I saw that, yeah. So they decided to put a limit, right, on the kind of processing power and the number of parameters yeah. of large language models that can be developed. Yeah. And that, to me, makes no sense. That, oh, if you have above 10,000 GPUs, you now have the capability to create an AGI. <laughs> or if your model has more than 100 billion parameters, mm. now that has to go through Congress, that has to be tested by the government and has to be mm -hmm. approved by the government. This makes no sense because on many ways, in many ways, because I think if we are doing this, we should be limiting the use of such models mm. instead of limiting the capability, like limiting the size of the models. If you say by the regulation you cannot use these models to spread fake news, mm. then that make that a law. Don't make that like a regulation side or something. Don't make it like, oh, you can, you can use a much smaller model to spread fake news if you want. You can mm. use a 5 billion parameter model if you want mm. to spread this information and to trick people and whatever else. Yeah. And that was like their main concern was well, let's yeah. prevent. But is there not an argument just playing the devil's advocate, yeah. you know, with GPT-3 and the kind of transformer papers, yeah. they realize that with more parameters, there's this emergent capabilities come where, mm. where it's basically, that means unexpected ways in which the model can generalize to tasks. Yeah. which we never expected it to be done, to be possible. So for example, GPT-3, after reaching a certain parameter size, it started being able to do zero-shot learning, mm -hmm. which is, um, which is you know, you, it can actually do tasks which we have not specifically trained it on in any way. And there's the fear not that if we keep going like this exponentially, mm -hmm. more emergent capabilities will emerge, which can theoretically, I mean, this is very yeah. theoretical, endanger people or, or you know, the model can take over in some way. I mean, again, it makes sense if we are in an SF movie or a book <laughs> or something, but we be. are <laughs> inferring quite a bit. I mean, this is again going back to Jan LeCun and mm. how he's arguing against these models, is that we still don't have a model that's on the level of intelligence of a mouse. Mm. And we are talking about hu superhuman intelligence. So we don't have a model that if we integrate into a mouse, it would have the same level of intelligence. Yeah. So, mm. <laughs> But you know, how do you compare a AI model to a mouse? This is the difficulty, right? Like, yeah. and that's go this goes into broader question, like how, what is intelligence? How do you define it? Yeah. Do you have any definitions? Because everyone's idea of intelligence is very different. Yeah, I think, I mean, I cannot really, I don't have a proper definition of intelligence mm. and I think really, or like just what, said, Or just like, what do you think it is? Like, what, what makes you think a mouse is intelligent and a, I don't know, a GPT-3 is less intelligent? Um, Self-sufficiency. Survival? Survival, yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, mothers don't need to survive, I guess. That's the I mean, well. yeah, but if we would give them the task to survive, I don't think they would do that. I think they would <laughs> die in, a, in basically an hour. Interesting. But they have no, like, body or, s or sense of self-preservation, right? It's just lines of code. Yeah, we can embody yeah. them, like the stuff that was done by uh, Boston Dynamics. Oh. Where they put the <laughs> G chat GPT or whatever onto the robot dog. So oh the God. we need to show a video of that, yeah. by the way. But yeah, yeah it, it's it's incredible, but also slightly gimmicky. Yeah. They just put like a chat GPT onto a robot dog. It gives them a nice tour of the um, Boston Dynamics facility. <laughs> no, exactly. So it, it is fun and I think it, it looks nice, but I don't know, would that model be able to do, like most, what current models are missing is like long-term planning, mm. long-term execution, uh, a bit of temporality, a bit of like following through and mm. continuous learning, continuous deployment, yeah. all of that, which is simply also an area we didn't focus on. I mean, yeah. no one has done something there, so. Yeah, but so, you know, certain things that AI can do, we I do perceive as very intelligent, mm. so, you know, doing mathematics or playing chess and go like beating the top players in the world i think to me yeah. those are subsets of intelligence i think i agree i think there are like two different things there like mm. i think playing chess and go i think you do need some intelligence mm. um the mathematics side i don't know the fact that like it can sum numbers up to three digits and then once you go above three digits it <laughs> cannot do it it means like oh maybe it didn't learn the algorithm of mm. summation it just understood like it just memorized some things so yeah maybe the intelligence is not <laughs> there maybe. yet for that but but can, you know from a neurologist point of view mm -hmm. um so one of the main domains is memory so in alzheimer's memory is very important both short-term and long-term memory mm -hmm. and historically we have been incorporated these these things into AI models. Uh, there's mm. also your ability to learn new tasks, so learning is very essential. There's also something called executive function, which is something controlled by your frontal lobe, and that's your ability to plan uh, in for the future and plan mm. complex tasks. So that's maybe something that the AI can be improved on. Like yeah, I said, yeah. they don't have a sense of planning as such, or you know, that's something we've been trying to, to um, incorporate uh, mm -hmm. very deeply. Uh, there's also social cognition, and that, and with that comes things like emotion as well, and the mm. social intelligence, reading the room. These things may be a bit more difficult to teach an yeah. AI model. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like, do, do you think modeling it after the human brain, after these domains, yeah. is a useful framework for developing AI models? Yeah, so I think there are some areas where it can be modeled after, there's some areas that can be modeled after the human brain, but maybe some, we will have to change some things, mm. like memory. If we attach a memory module to an AI, which is basically a big hard drive, it mm. can remember everything ever. So it doesn't make too much sense to test it like, oh, does it remember what happened in 2005? Of course it does. I mean, it, it doesn't forget anything. The only way it could forget is if, if you remove mm. that from the memory. So it has basically perfect recollection of past events. The only thing that can, then goes on top of that is can it reason based on those events? Mm. So if you ask it to combine a couple of those events and see like, oh, what were the consequences of something that happened in 2009? And then over years explore what happened. So that is like memory combined with maybe the executive function that you were saying. So mm -hmm. the, the planning part. So that yeah. part could be much more difficult. But I think the memory side is... Mm. obvious but i do think it makes a lot of sense to combine it uh, model it after these categories mm. because we still want memory it's easy to add to llm but i still think we want it yeah because i remember when chat gpt first came out one of the big complaints was that it doesn't remember yeah. the initial parts of the conversation yeah so clearly it's useful to think of this kind of framework and would you also say the the AI the architecture of LSTMs, long short term yeah. memory, models, like was that driven by a need to improve the memory of these um, recurrent neural networks? That was basically 
modeled again a bit probably after the human brain where you have like short-term and long-term mm -hmm. memory and it was basically that because sometimes you need to keep something in the short-term memory that is currently relevant mm -hmm. and then if you see that there is a big point that you learn from that then you store it in the long-term yeah. memory so that was basically the idea behind LSTMs it's just you have two types of memory mm -hmm. one is almost persistent gets updated rarely and one mm -hmm. is the one that's constantly being updated yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, looking at the current architecture of transformers, and the paper is literally called "Attention is all you need." Yeah, but, you know, attention is only one of the domains I assess in a patient. You know, one of mm -hmm. six domains. So for me, as a neurologist, I genuinely side of Jan Lecun mm. because I think that attention isn't all you need because we see patients that, <laughs> you know, have attention but they don't have the other mm. facilities and are clearly struggling a lot with real mm. life. Um, and likewise, people with sometimes poor attention, they can manage from day to day. So yeah. it's, I don't think it's all you need. And I fully agree that there needs to be, like the current architecture that focuses solely on attention, I think it's, it's, it can't be it. Like this cannot be the architecture that gets us to AGI. Yeah, I hope not. I mean, we were saying this in the past and I think, I think like if we would achieve AGI by these means, I think it would be very, very sad. It would be like, I don't know, human mind, has, it, it is like a beautiful, <laughs> complex thing. Yeah. And this is like, oh, this is attention is all you need. You can write the formula in, in a line. And it's basically brute forcing the human mind, exactly. I think. It's just, and you just keep feeding it more yeah. and more tra the and I, data. I do think, I don't know, this is again a bit philosophical, but I do think you, would, you will be able to achieve mm. AGI just by doing this. Yeah. If you put enough data into it and scale with enough parameters, I think you would get there. Yeah, I, I don't like that approach of let's just pile on more and more data and the yeah. machine's going to get smarter. Because, you know, there's a post by Jan Lecun that makes a really good point. So I'm just going to read, read this. Mm -hmm. He's basically said that animals and humans get very smart very quickly mm -hmm. with a lot less data than we feed large language models or large multimodal models at the moment. Mm -hmm. So here he's, he said that current LLMs, the amount of text data they are trained on, mm -hmm. would take 20,000 years for a human to read. Mm. That's astounding. Like, you know, and, and we can see this. Like, when, we, when I go to med school, you know, I read textbooks, I read papers. I don't read anywhere near as much as ChatGPT does. Mm -hmm. Yet we've seen in evaluations in medicine that, yeah. you know, we still do a lot better in exams as human doctors. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly that something is not fine-tuned of that architecture. I feel like there needs to be a bit more. I think I agree, but also it should be clear that this model has to learn everything ever just mm -hmm. from text. Yeah, and text is not it, right? Yeah, I think there is, we need other modalities, which is of, which I think like a human receives more data in just a couple of years than this ChatGPT LLM. Mm. A human in five years is trained on more data than an LLM. Mm. And I think that's because a lot of the data is coming from images, a lot of the data yeah. is coming from sound, a lot of the data is coming from tactile stuff, a lot of from moving in space, from many, yeah. many, many other modalities. So I do think mm. even today, Jan Lecun is basically arguing there that humans learn much faster. Yeah. Is that really true? We receive significantly more data mm. than an LLM because an LLM is basically in the beginning an empty box. There mm -hmm. is nothing inside and we train everything it knows about the world mm. simply from text. That's true. I mean, text is basically a subsection of visual and, and you know, we, we process so much data as toddlers. Yeah. We learn so much in the, in the first few years, just crawling around the yeah. tactile feel of the floor, interacting as well with the world, like physics, like throwing mm -hmm. things, putting things in their mouths. And, you know, there's all kinds of senses that come with that. So maybe reinforces certain learning habits. Yeah. Because, you know, we all talk about this visual learners, this auditory yes. learners, this kinetic learners. So, yeah, maybe that reinforces it when you use multiple modalities. Yeah. And I just think like a lot of the data we as humans receive is true. 
is like yeah. empirical evidence data where you do something, you see how it works and like, okay, I got it. So you mm. learn a lot of these like small, simple, logical explanations, things mm. that you are doing every day that I somehow think like keep you grounded, keep you... A lot of that knowledge can be applied to all other areas. I mean, we see that in every field ever. You don't start mm. learning medicine or math by going immediately to the most complex thing ever. Mm. You start gradually with the small things and, up, like, and you build up on that. Mm. And I do think it is very, very similar here. Also for a child, we start with very simple things mm. and it's learning everyday stuff, how to walk, how to move, how mm. to do things, logical planning, what will happen if I do this, yeah. gravity, the real world. Like, Yeah, I guess the world is like a sandbox for a baby, yeah. you know. They, I think it's a lot more intuitive, like reading how an apple falls yes. and reading about gravity versus actually having an apple in your hand and dropping yeah. it and seeing how it, how it works. And then also just, you know, doing things differently the next time and then seeing how mm. things changes and having every sense reinforce that. Yes. There no, may exactly be something that. behind that, yeah. And I think that is extremely important. An LLM starts learning from possibly the most advanced text ever. Yeah. There is no like order in the text mm. it receives. So LLMs are basically like just trained on very, very large amounts of text. Exactly. Yeah. And that text is not ordered. No. It starts with, okay, the first thing it reads can be a book about quantum physics. <laughs> so it cannot, yeah. that makes no sense. And also it cannot test any of those things. Mm. If it tells, if there is a story and it is writing about a car crash, yeah. I think living or seeing a car mm. crash is significantly more impactful than or you see many many more things than just mm. reading in a sentence oh they crashed with the car and everything was fine yeah that's very interesting um and just going back to jan lecun he, he does say the total amount of visual data yeah. processed by a two-year-old yeah it is actually uh, is larger than the amount of data yes. needed to train a large language model, but still pretty reasonable, he said. So yeah. he's calculated roughly in two years, he said, or roughly 32 million seconds, yeah. we have essentially 2 million optic nerve fibers yeah. carrying roughly 10 bytes per second each. I don't know how, how he reached that 10 bytes per second. So he says that's, that's a total of 6 to the power of 14 bytes. Mm -hmm. And he said the volume of data used for LLM training is typically in the order of 1 to the power of uh, 10 to the 13. So mm -hmm. it's basically like at least a 10 order magnitude more yeah. that a toddler receives. And he still only has calculated vision. Yeah. He didn't include audio. Audio. He didn't tactile yeah. stuff. And all. Ha have you seen this data set called... Um, is, I found this really interesting data set the other day. It's called SACAM. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of this? So, no, I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> so it's basically, it sounds incredible. It's basically a large longitudinal audio visual database where they've put cameras on toddlers' heads mm. <laughs> yep. from the years of, uh, of zero to two years. And whilst they're crawling around and doing whatever, mm -hmm. the camera is just recording yep. everything they see. So that would be the perfect test to see whether you know, an AI model can learn something meaningful about the world just yeah. from those, uh, that training data sets. I agree. I, th I mean, that would be, I think it is a good data set. And it is still, I think, missing the stuff of experimentation, yeah. of interacting with the world, because I think mm. that is where we probably learn the most. Mm. Of course, from other people also and all of that. But there is one thing I don't think anyone is mentioning mm. and I think all of these models are missing and that is the way also humans learn is interaction with other humans mm. and I think no AI is doing that or not to any extent that humans are doing it. I think the social aspect is yeah. very important in learning and you don't have like 10 AIs talking with each other and trying You've to understand the You've not seen that video task. where they put a chat GPT next to a chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's no, not I learning. Don't, I, don't. <laughs> yeah. I guess as humans we do have a motivation to socialize with other humans mm -hmm. for connection, uh, for relationships, but AI models don't really have that and, and sometimes I wonder whether that's partly the missing piece because as humans we have a lot of intrinsic motivations and personalities uh, and temperaments 
we do things and we、mm. plan for the future. Like we do things without any clear reward or monetary gain or, or anything. You know,、mm-hmm. I do a lot of work outside of my work as a doctor, like doing this podcast,、yeah. like that. You know, it's purely just from. Interest and joy, and it may not bring anything. This is purely、yeah. like I just like talking about it. I,、um, I feel like AI models don't have that intrinsic motivation and the sense of you know self-preservation, doing things for your survival or planning for、mm-hmm. the future. Yeah, I think this one is going into basically like the different rewards that humans、yeah. receive versus what an AI model receives. So. How you train an AI model, or how you tell it, what is the motivation for an AI model, is basically after everything it does,、mm. you tell it that was good or bad. Yeah. In, in fact, not good or bad, but correct or incorrect.、Mm. So there is only one reward function at the end, and it's only telling you correct, incorrect, or how、yeah. correct, how well, incorrect. Like, yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah, there、uh, is、yeah. no like, there is no you are doing that for fun. Yeah. There's no you're doing that because it brings you joy. There's、yeah. no you're doing that because of love or whatever else.、Yeah. You just have correct, incorrect. Yeah, because our dopamine systems are really complex. It's not just good or bad. It's you、yeah. know sometimes we feel like embarrassment or sometimes like you running a marathon,、yeah. which is completely illogical. Like it's illogical to me why you'd put yourself through like、yeah. a marathon. But at the end, there's that. Intense sense of joy that people describe, and、yeah. the huge dopamine release after going through something really strenuous. But, you know that doesn't make sense. I, you know, I can't see an AI model causing itself like grief and trouble <laughs> in order to get. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't quite make sense. I think that is because our today's model, the models we have today, are very one-dimensional. They are trained only on one thing. They are trained to do only one thing,、mm-hmm. and they have only one reward. Everything is just like it seems extreme. We are, as we mentioned, we are completely brute forcing it. <laughs> yeah. We just found one thing that works well, and we decided we will scale scale this a trillion times. <laughs> That's it. Like we did not explore anything except for this. We just said like it should work, or We saw the in like spark of AGI. We're like, okay, push、mm, this as much yeah, as we yeah, can. Yeah, we're basically putting all our eggs in one basket. Yeah, and I think, yeah. So th- I guess just to wrap up, I think we both. It sounds like we both agree that with with Jan Lacoon that we think there probably is more to it. Like, there's different architectures or different reward models that、mm. need to. We need to discover in order to reach artificial general int- intelligence, and the camp of Jeffrey Hinton and things, brute forcing it, and also all this AI regulation is probably just a bit of over the top kind of、yeah. fear mongering.、Um, I think that's where we stand. That's that's our main hot takes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we are over regulating extensively,、mm. and we should really calm down a bit and just. Look at things realistically. Don't regulate in a sense that we are saying, "Oh, a trillion parameters、yeah. instead of me." No, regulate in a sense where you say, "Don't use it for bad stuff. If you、mm. use it, you'll be punished or whatever." Mm. So mm. just do the standard stuff that is that makes sense. Yeah. So you know, which camp are you on? Actually, we would love to hear in the comments. Are you on the architecture is fine? We just need more data, or do you think we need to be modeling more architectures and、uh, behind the human brain and other intelligence? Reward models,、um, and that's it for today. So、uh, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. Bye.